to take care of that. Recording is in progress. Wonderful. So um, we're starting the meeting. Call to order. I'm introducing the agenda on my screen now. We'll have a short introduction of your Electoral District Association board members that are here this evening. Uh, I'll do a couple of notes about housekeeping. Um, our technical expert, Ken, will give us a short overview of the Zoom platform so we know what we're working with. And we'll start in with our uh, candidates who will give a 30 second elevator pitch of why they are here and why they'd like to be our candidate. There'll be a question period. We'll be taking questions in the Q&A function of Zoom that Ken will explain how to use. And um, our attendees can ask questions of the candidates and the candidates will have a 90 second period to answer questions. Um, at the end of our question period, we'll have closing remarks. Each candidate will have three minutes to wrap up and uh, we will call an end to our very successful meeting this evening. I will make a note of it now, but I will also remind everyone at the end of the meeting that our next meeting is a, the formal virtual nomination meeting, which will be held next Monday, June 28th from 7 until 8 p.m. It will be followed by a 48 hour email election period from 9 p.m. Monday until 9 p.m. Wednesday. And the ballots you will use in that election will be sent out by the Green Party uh, at the start of that election period. And you'll have 48 hours to cast your vote online and virtually. If there is anyone who is unable to use email to access their email on the day, they may, as an exception, call our returning officer, who is Robin Spano, who is here this evening, um, during that election email period and only during that period to give their vote by phone and it will be forwarded centrally and be registered with all of the other votes. Uh, more details about this whole procedure can be seen at our website, uh, wssgreens.ca, and we will post that link into the chat uh, and into the Q&A so everybody can see it. So I'll stop sharing my screen and move on to the first point of our agenda is a short introduction of our board. I'm just going to move myself out of this sun that has appeared here and is distracting me. I can't see what I'm doing. <laughs> I'd like to introduce uh, Mike Bosma, who is our interim CEO after Maureen uh, Rodius uh, had to step down. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Robin Spano, who is also functioning as our returning officer, making sure that this is a fair and equitable election. Uh, she is also our question curator for this evening. Uh, I'd like to introduce John Poville. John, if you give a wave who is our, our resident wordsmith. When we need text formulated, he is our uh, person who is really, really good at that. And also this evening's timekeeper during question period. Um, I'd like to introduce Ken, who is our invaluable technical expert with all things technical and uh, we would not be able to function without him. Uh, lastly, my name is Richard Warrington and I am the uh, financial agent for the Electoral District Association and this evening's meeting chair and moderator. Um, a few notes on, on just on general housekeeping. In a few moments, um, Ken will explain how to use the question and answer function in Zoom. And that is the way that attendees will be able to ask questions of our candidates and receive wonderful answers. Um, None of us, I think, is very familiar with Zoom, so I'll ask Ken to do a very short introduction of the, of the platform that we're looking at and how you navigate around in it. I would also like to introduce you to our new candidates, the stars of the evening. Um, I said to myself that I would flip a coin to see who got the option to start first. So heads, it'll be Mike, and tails, it's Amanda, and it is heads. So Mike, if you, you would have the option, would you like to start first yourself or did you want to give your uh, the option to uh, the other candidate? I'll pass it on. Go ahead, go ahead, man. Yeah. Hi everyone. So just a quick introduction. I wear many hats. I'm a business owner, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a mother, I'm a consultant, I'm a mentor, I'm a volunteer, and now I'm a nominee. Tonight we have one choice before us, and that is who will lead us to success in the federal election when it's called. And what we know in hospitality is that leadership is about how we make others feel. I believe this translates well into politics as well. And so I'm inviting you 
to think about how we make you feel tonight. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Good timing. <laughs> That's the challenge tonight is to stick to that. Yeah. 30 second elevator pitch. Sure, yeah. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. It's nice to see you, Amanda, and everybody else. Um, this is an important thing right now for us to be able to have this discourse, introduce each other, and, and find a good candidate. I'm actually feeling rock solid about both of us. So I think we actually, and about our EDA and about our writing. So I think we're in good shape. Um, myself, just a real quick introduction. I was a filmmaker, then I worked in the NGO sector, and then more recently, I've been the executive director of the British Columbia Council for International Cooperation. And I see the flag has gone up. So that's a quick intro. Um, now, Maureen did mention an echo coming from my microphone a little earlier on, so I will try to remember to always mute myself when I am not speaking, um, which will happen very shortly, because now we are moving on to the main part of the evening, question period, and Robin, our question curator, will take over and uh, read questions aloud from the Q&A section um, and supplementing with other questions as needed. So thank you, Robin. Great. And have we told the candidates or the nominee candidates how the timing is going to work? We've got two minutes per question. Do they know that? Okay, fantastic. So I don't see any questions yet in the Q&A. So everyone, please do submit. Oh, I do. I got a new one in right now. Um, and should I tell people who's asking the question or is it obvious? Like can everyone see. So this one's from Remy Sharon. And he's saying, when doing canvassing, how do you plan on answering questions related to all of the infighting that has been reported on in the media with our leader? How do you want one of us to start or are you on? Yeah, yeah. So how are we doing that? Are they alternating who starts, Richard? Um, if is it who started is last, started next? Does that make sense? I think so, yes. If so the Amanda started first last time, so go with Mick this time. Okay. Um, sure. What it, it's a great question. It's obviously in the media. It's all over the place right now. Is what are we doing? The Green Party's getting a lot of very bad press. Let's just face that right away. And what I've been saying to people is, hey, wait a second here, but the ship is sound. There's there's people at the helm and they're and we're having our, our fights right now or our disc our discourse, but we are far from gone. We, because And what I say there is because if you think of the bones of the Green Party, the actual ship is good. It's sound. It's based on six core principles that are not going away tomorrow. And they are actually not dependent on any individual leader coming along. I could come along and influence the Green Party, but the actual core principles of the Green Movement, the International Greens, the core principles that we, are, that we have based our identity on, those are not going away. So the, you know, like nonviolence is not going away. Uh, the idea of, of ecological wisdom not going away, climate change not going away. So when we stand up and we say, people say, well, what about your party? You're, you're in demise. It's going, no, it isn't. It's going strong. It's a blip. It's, it's a thing that's going on. It's a growing pain. We'll get through it. We'll get through this and we will continue on. And our ship, the actual ship, sailing in the direction that it needs to go. And I believe it's heading the political discourse in Canada. It's doing its job right now, which is influencing the other parties incredibly. We see the Liberals come out with a climate change doubling of, of funding at the G7 meeting. Why? It's because the Greens did that. We laid the foundation for that. We set the course and we will continue to set the political course in this country. And just because we're having a conversation right now, which is actually one that other ones don't have the guts to have, does not mean in any way that we are in demise. It's the opposite. So there's my 10 seconds. I'll hand it over to Anna. Hi, Remy. Thanks for the question. We wish you were up here tonight. Uh, so thank you for your contribution. Thank you for being here. I think that this is a really healthy time in the party. And the, the reason that I say that is, is that we're going through growing pains. And, and when we're talking to constituents, we need to talk about the fact that we're having diverse point of views. It's a very challenging time. We're up against multiple challenges on multiple fronts. And so we're gonna experience this internally within our party. We're experiencing it in our communities. What we always want to go back to and, and building off what Mike says is our values, right? And really going back to the values, but also we need leadership to also be involved in bringing that unity and that consensus together and so right now that's our focus is bringing the party together and attracting new voices and we want to make this a party that's attractive to young people and young voices and diverse voices and so certainly when we're addressing the turmoil i say flip the narrative i say that no we've got a lot of momentum and turmoil like this is healthy this is growth so thank you 
Well, that's encouraging. Thanks, guys. Um, I've, I've got another question that's just come up. What do you see as the most critical issue facing our riding as a Green Party? And so let's start with Amanda this time. Most critical issue. So uh, the most critical that I see right now is that we lack a commitment to a green future. Uh, that's at a government level. At a community level, we lack the support to build back better or just build better in the first place. And at a family level, we're working harder for less. And so I see that the crises that we're experiencing are, are interconnected. The biggest issue that I hear from our community is one of both climate emergency, but also, also healthcare. And those are what are we seeing in the polls? And then equally in Sea to Sky, we're seeing an affordability crisis. And so our party is the first to come out and, and, and put out that we want a universal basic income, a guaranteed one that will provide us with the opportunity to address the affordability issues that we're seeing and the inequality gaps that are growing. And further to that, when we're talking about the most important issues, we really want to be listening to our members and listening to the constituents because everyone is going to say that something else is most important to them. And at all points, we want to just go back to where the green platform stands on, on those issues. Thank you very much. Hey, Mike, you're muted. Hey, you're muted. Start again with that. You would think I'd done enough Zoom to know better than that. <laughs> what I was going to say is the, un, the critical issues are unfolding before us right in front of us in real time. We had us uh, hit a record temperature with Squamish yesterday. On, on Saturday, they're predicting, and Sunday, they're predicting in, in Kamloops that we will hit 45 degrees. So far, the record temperature of all time was 1939, and it was only 40 degrees. So imagine that. All over the North America, we're in a heat wave right now. It's in our face. And right now, when we look at that, and we think that's not just climate change, because what one thing we know about goal 13 climate change with the sustainable development goals is that it's related to all the other goals it's related to all these other things if you knock down those old growth forests you get rid of that carbon it's related to climate change so right now we have right in front of us a huge opportunity to keep reminding people that the very thing that we've been saying as greens all along which is that these things are interconnected we're living in a biosphere we need to have that ecological wisdom to see that these are not single issues they're interconnected issues and we're seeing the symptoms all around us right now and i can't think of a better time right now to change the discourse and to show people when you go outside tomorrow morning and it's 37 degrees or it's 43 degrees, does it not occur to you to think you need to vote green? This is the time. This is, this is our very moment to stand forward and say, vote green, vote green now, because the, the actual things that we've been saying are collapsing in front of our eyes as we speak. And so this North American heat wave is not an anomaly. It's the beginning of June. And we're not supposed to see heat waves like this until August. So I'll stop there and just say that the most important issues are actually happening and people can feel them right now. They should be able to feel them in their bones. <clears throat> um, I've got another question here. Let's see. This may have been something you've addressed already, so maybe give this, go this one a quick answer. All the issues Mike just mentioned are important and need to be addressed. What would you say is the most single important issue to you? Is that to me or is that because it was it's to both of you? Like, I guess let's just pick an issue and make a short, let's go with 30 seconds on this one. So it's a good question, but it's half answered. In 30 right. seconds, what's the most important issue to you? Which one of us though? I'm just- Oh, you start. Makes okay, sense. yeah. The most important issue to me right now is actually biospheric survival for us as a species. In the, in the Before now in 2030, I have a nine-year-old daughter. She's the most important thing in my life besides the people that I love, my partner, Steph, and the other people. I love them all. And when I look around at the planet right now, I actually am deeply, deeply concerned. It's why I'm, I'm standing up for the Greens right now. It's because at a deep core level, when I look into the future, what I see is a lot of trouble and it's coming fast and it's coming down hard. And it means some really strong decisions need to be made. And if you were to say which one of those is an issue i would say it's a feeling it's not an issue many issues are unfolding but it's a feeling inside trouble is happening and it's here now and we need to make some good hard political decisions and change the direction of where we're going awesome yeah amanda 
Yeah, if, if I was to narrow it down, it, which is, is tough, but I would definitely agree with Mike that we need to dramatically decarbonize immediately. We must commit to zero carbon, not in 2050, now. Like we only have a few years, as he mentioned, the temperatures are already changing. We're gonna have more climate disasters. We have to decarbonize and we have to focus on it as an entire society, all hands on deck. That's what we gotta do. Thank you. Robin, you're now muted. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we don't have any new questions in the Q&A, but we do have some prepared from for just in case we don't have, we have a wall between questions. Um, a lot of voters have misconceptions that the green fiscal policy is based on wishful thinking and that we just want to hand out free money. How would you show that green fiscal policy is realistic and responsible? And so this one's for Amanda first, and you get the full 90 seconds again. Yes, thank you. So I have spent some time with this because there's been some criticism of Patrick Weiler on terms of the affordable childcare that they just released in terms of the government. And John came out first, you know, swinging, saying, you know, what about accountability? And so I thought about that. And, and I think that this is something really interesting in terms of some party alignment in the sense that the Greens are also asking for accountability when it comes to government funds all government funds and that's what's going to make it fiscally responsible that's why we're fiscally responsible is we want to stop wasting government money on things that don't have an impact whether it's on the sustainable sustainable development goals or whether it's to do with dramatically decarbonizing our society and and reducing emissions and so we need accountability on every single government dollar that is spent in terms of these two both the social and the environmental and in terms of just talking about the realism with regards to our policy and addressing the fact that, that there's been some criticism, certainly I, I think that as a party, we do need to be more cautious in how we release our proposals and have them very much vetted by experts because there is some holes to our, our policy platforms and we really want to cost those out before we come out and say them. So I would say I would take a more cautious approach and that's why we get criticized in terms of wishful thinking. Um, but I think that we want to be fiscally responsible. Thank you. Yeah, my response to that is that I often hear this this wishful thinking or you're being unrealistic, et cetera. But then I, I love punching the numbers with folks like that. And I love saying, okay, let's punch the numbers and let's look at what a fighter jet costs. Or let's look at what you want to spend on fighter jets and defense, which is $88 billion. And let's compare that to what we're saying our priorities, like renewable energy and solar panels. And let's just do the numbers. In fact, nothing makes me happier when people come in and they say, oh, renewable energy doesn't work. I say, come in, look at the fridge, look at my hydro bill, look at the solar panels, let's do the math and follow the money. One of the things that people do is they miss the big picture. It's kind of like penny wise, pound foolish. You're not seeing the big dollars. So when I, I used to stand up in front of people and I would say, hey, did you know that three and a half billion people, the bottom half of the world's population has the same income as only 11 people? And then somebody stood up in a crowd and they said, actually, that's changed. It's now only eight. Then I got up recently and somebody said, it's only now six. So six people, you could fill a van, have enough money as the bottom half. And then people will say, you're just being wishful thinking because you want universal, you want universal income. And I look at it and go, wait, wait, wait. Did you not see the big picture? Did you not see where the money was flowing? And that's something as Greens that we have to continually point out that let's look at perverse subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. And then let's compare that to the, the fact that we don't want subsidies for, uh, for, for renewables. We just want a, a level playing field. And then let's play the math because we'll beat you every time on watt for watt for solar panels compared to nuclear and coal. And this is where the folks go, they, their eyes go up. And we have to remember it's a limbic response they have, not a rational response. And so it's very important that we do that in a friendly way. One that says, hey, let's just punch the numbers together, right? Cool. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Oh, here's a question it's from Amanda. When I talked, from a different Amanda, when I talked to my young teen nephews, they talk about their strong interest in the Green Party. The 18-year-old realizes he can vote in the next election. How do we reach these young ones? 
Oh, this for Mike first. Okay, sure. I, I mean, being a person who works with young people all the time, I, I have a, at BCCIC, we sent the largest delegation of young people to the United Nations on climate change, the only ones that went to the prep meeting. I mean, we have an enormous number of, of young people and people ask me, how do you do that? And I said, well, the, the trick is, is you don't do it. You get young people to talk to young people and they make that connection. And what we have to concentrate on here is not leaving them stranded because people say, oh, well, then we'll get the young people to do it. But no, what I keep saying is, no, it's an intergenerational approach in which we together work with young people and young people work with young people and make that connection. So do you see how it's related? It's not saying here, young people, you go solve that, take on all the world's problems. We screwed it up. Now you deal with it and hope that the younger generation will do it because there isn't even enough time for them to get into leadership positions to be able to do that. So what I've been saying is let's take this intergenerationally. The wisdom of some folks have been through a lot of times and let's work with young people. But when the best communicators with young people is young people with young people. I mean, they just know how to do that Instagram stuff and the, all the stuff they do on social media with their phones. They're just way ahead of me on that. So we don't even try. I don't even try that. I just say, let's, let's, let's get together. We work together. And now you folks communicate with the folks that you know you can change their minds. And the in, amazing thing there is that they have an amazing amount of energy for that. Like one thing they don't want to do is just suddenly have to go into this field with no help, no mentorship, no nothing. And that's where we can learn from that. And let's, let's quit this uh, generational division and think intergenerationally, but also put onus on young people to empower them to get out there and get, get going. Get, let's get some action happening. <clears throat> Thanks. How about you, Amanda? Oh, well, I love this one because this is definitely one of my focuses and has been for the last couple of months. Last week, I got to speak at a high school I was invited to and wow, I mean, the youth are very much engaged with the climate emergency. And, and so where we're sitting is that we're looking at some youth that uh, are going to mobilize and who are going to vote green. And then we've got youth that are very much disaffected, very much feeling um, there's now a new, I think a new mental health um, experience in terms of climate stress. And this is starting, and we're seeing it in our youth. And so in terms of reaching the youth, we're talking, we're not talking about a group that we can just go and grab and say, you're the youth, so please. It's that every single youth is going to be a little bit different. And what we, what we wanna do is make our party as inclusive and as attractive as possible. And so when Mike says that I don't even do that Instagram stuff, I'm saying, no, I do all of that stuff because <laughs> we are going to need to communicate with all the youth in all the forms that they wanna communicate in. And we need to be the party of innovation, the party of solutions, the party of inclusion. And we're gonna do it on multiple mediums, wherever they are, wherever they're mobilizing, let's be there. Thank you. Awesome. Um, I've got another question from Darcy saying, what is your plan to reach out and connect with West Van voters? So that's for Amanda first. West Van, yeah, so <laughs> I actually love West Van. I, I worked at Savory Island Bakery years ago, um, which is sort of a heartbeat. It's such a great place um, just near Ambleside and uh, Certainly recently in terms of my engagement of West Van, I've spent some time with Marianne Booth in terms of talking with her about the about West Van. We're very aligned in terms of what we want to see for that community. The main challenge that she has is that the population in West Van is aging. And West Van is not, because of affordability, it hasn't been able to attract a diverse uh, people, it hasn't been able to attract uh, families that can't afford to live there. So she's really working on the, the livability of her community. And so certainly in terms of reaching out to West Van, uh, we're, talking, we're talking about the realism that it's, it's an older population. And so we're gonna wanna be door to door, phone, phone and phone knocking, all of it <laughs> with those, the, those people because an older population, they're gonna vote based on connection. Right. And, and then so that's certainly how I would address uh, reaching out to West Vancouver and the businesses. The businesses is one area that I really want to focus on because I think businesses hold a lot of a lot of clout in West Vancouver because they've been contributing to that community for some time. Um, in terms of reaching out to West Van or reaching out to any group, uh, I think it is really critical to hear them first. 
and to understand like where where what are the issues that they feel that they're facing right now because any kind of a binary thinking like an us and then there's the west bad folks or anything like that that it one has to kind of get in and go how what is going on in any community and what are the issues that you're feeling and are important to you and right now that like everybody is saying okay everybody is feeling covid everybody is feeling the vaccine and and the build back better and some of the language that we can use like let's just say to the entrepreneurial spirited person the build back better message is very attractive the idea that we're not just going to build back and go back to normal we're going to go back to a better and more uh, resilient future and to be able to talk in terms that are going to work for the people for the specific demographics that you're trying to target is critically important and that does require getting on you on your feet on the ground talking to people and that is that's something that we can't just rely on social media and by the way I actually have an instagram account just to correct self correction but um i it is it is something we can we can rely on but we also have to we can't forget about those old techniques of getting out there and talking to people face to face and having those conversations and those bridges and i do think the green party was onto a very smart thing last time which was to listen to get out there and listen first and go what's going on in your life what's important to you and then making that connection so that you're not trying to convince anybody of anything you're trying to draw out what they're already convinced of and relate it to our messages which is around those six core principles oh do you have something to say amanda can I add something? Sure. Am I allowed? Okay. I yeah. also think the Ambleside Farmers Market is a really key opportunity to bring in some more voters. That I just wanted to add. Cool. Um, I've got another question from Remy, who we wish was competing tonight, but that's okay. Um, Remy says, we have such a large riding in addition to West Van. How do you plan on reaching all corners of our riding, including the different First Nations communities? I guess I'm first on that. Um, yes, you're first on that. I'm trying to keep track. I can't remember who is. No, uh, you're right. Yeah, this is critical. I'm right back to the same answer that I just gave about West Bend, which is what's important in your community. So in recently I did a, again, an Instagram thing, but what I did is I was publishing a little video about what is important right now in the Squamish nation, right in West Bend there is the fact that they're putting the, they're idling the trains right next to people's homes. That's what's important for people. And so when we come in as Green Party and hear that, we, can, we should be able to bridge a discussion about idling. We should be able to uh, bridge a discussion about why Indigenous rights in UNDRIP, it is, it is unthinkable that you would drive your train in and idle it next to people's homes all night and that somehow they don't get heard. And so in my discussions with counselors and people at, at Squamish Nation, when I go to their community, it's not a matter of I'm coming in with my agenda. It's can I come in and hear what's going on in your community and then relate that to what's important to Greens. And in Greens, we do we do emphasize this idea that UNDRIP is something we have to do, reconciliation is something to do, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Bill C-12. These are all important things that we can have uh, very valid conversations with people, but on their terms about the things that they're concerned about in their communities, because that's how people think. That's how they feel about things, right? So I would say that, that that can be done with every First Nations group throughout, and we can assume that they're not all the same. They're all going to have very distinct issues and feelings about what's going on in their communities. And it's up to us to get on the ground and not go with our agenda, but go in and hear what's going on for them and then relate it to our agenda. Thank you, by the way, for that Kleenex box. It's very handy to see that 10 second thing. So, yeah. I, excuse me. I really like what Mike said, because I also agree. I think each of the First Nations communities are going through different issues, different challenges, but shared in the sense that they, they we come from a colonial oppressive history that we need to reconcile. And, and reconciliation definitely needs to be fundamental to any approach right now, any government approach, any business approach. It needs to be at the forefront. We understand that Right now, we're going through <laughs> quite some time in terms of addressing what happened in Kamloops. I don't think anyone's actually that surprised that this, been, this has been going on in communities. There's lots of healing that needs to happen right now. So what, right now, when I'm working on the First Nations Engagement com uh, Committee, I'm on a committee to engage First Nations. This has been a learning experience for me, and certainly... It's important to be invited. Um, it's important not to come in with uh, ideas about what you want them to do for you or asks. Uh, and as Mike said, we're there to, to listen, but also we're there to really actually support the work that's already going on. The number one thing that I continue to hear when I was um, seeking to engage uh, the Lillooet uh, community, I hear a lot about poverty and opportunities. 
there's some real poverty in these communities that we need to build into any kind of approach that we have is we need to address the poverty. It's, it's really fundamental. And so all development money, anything that needs to be asked at the first is what are we bringing? What are we supporting? What are we coming with? Thank you. Thanks guys. Um, I've got another question from the chat. Let's see what it is. Oh, the Habs are up three, nothing. Thanks. <laughs> 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 Good to know. Um, okay, so I have a question for you. What kind of campaigning would you do before the election is called? And we'll start with Amanda. Great. Uh, thanks, Robin. So campaigning, it's already happening. So in terms of what I'm focused on, uh, as I said earlier, I'm really focused on the youth, but also in terms of campaigning, I really want to do more radio engagement, really getting out understanding so the people are hearing that the Green Party is is mobilizing. We really need to have a green presence. And so certainly radio is is my next focus. Also, Jenica Atwin was very successful with her radio advertising. I also think that we need a presence throughout. It's a very expansive riding. And so I would like to be able to travel to each of the main communities and really start to actually, you know, just be in front of the grocery store, really talking with people. That's where everyone is. We don't necessarily need to go to every single home, but we need to go to those real junctures where people are so that we can talk to multiple people. The other campaigning that I see happening is on, on online. We will need to continue to have a social media presence. We need to engage and mobilize using the old growth forest protests that are happening, the mobilization around the Extinction Rebellion, the climate education reform campaign. We need to bring this together and really start to, to make sure that the Green Party is a part of when people are thinking about these campaigns, they're also thinking, okay, and how am I gonna vote? Thanks. Yeah, so what, how, how do you start a campaign? And in my I was, it's an interesting question because for me, the campaigning started uh, decades ago in the sense that when you actually hold a green ethic, it's not something you start and finish during an election campaign. You're consistently doing it all the time. Like, I, I mean, I've come from the Ferry Creek, you know, protests. I'm still writing, I've been writing two uh, opinion articles in the post on, on uh, NATO. And so on. This, this is something that's a way of life. And if you get the luck during an election campaign to be able to be a candidate, then you wear that hat. But for me, the activities don't change and they won't change if I'm not a nominee. I just continue with my life, which has always been one of social activism, social justice and environmentalism. So you don't take the hat off. You have these opportunities during these select periods of time, like an election campaign, to focus, focus, focus on the politics in Canada. But when you're a Green Party person, you're an expression of an ethic and it doesn't stop and start with a campaign. That's pretty key. So I kind of think this stuff all the time. And if, if you go back and look at Mike Simpson's life, you see 25 years on the Canadian Environmental Network. You see years and years on the Canadian Council for National Cooperation on the boards. It doesn't end. It doesn't start, doesn't end. It's just, it's going to keep going. And even after I was thinking the other day, he said, when are you going to retire? I said, I don't see how you retire from this stuff. Like, how do you just drop it? It's a way of thinking and it's a, a, a way of life. And it kind of comes back to the original thing that I was saying about the Green Party is that when you're building a movement, a political movement based on uh, the foundation of bones like that, it doesn't, the blips that we're in, enduring right now are just blips because we're gonna endure right through that and keep going and we're, we'll still be doing environmental work 10 years from now. I am absolutely positive of that. Cool, thanks Mike, thanks, thanks Amanda. Um, that actually leads into our next question, which is how will you help this campaign if you lose the nomination contest? And so we'll hmm. start with Mike. Well, I'll just say, right, how do you lose something when the whole idea is to add to the discourse? As we speak right now, we're influencing each other. I hear Amanda, Amanda hears me, you all, we all have a discourse and we evolve and we transition our thinking. That's the role of Green Party people. So we don't lose, we influence, we move things. The liberals move our direction. The NDP moves our direction. Everybody starts moving our direction because we're holding the discourse. That's why I say the ship is sound. It's based on a perennial philosophy. You look at Article Article 3 of our Constitution, which so, so emphasizes love and compassion. What other political party does that? Has the guts to do that? So if we act and we do, and how do you lose if you can express that and people can see that and they can move towards us? There's no such thing as losing. It's, a, it's the idea that you're influencing, you're transforming. And this brings us back to the, the critical thing that they're saying in the SDGs, which is to transform. It's transformational thinking. So it's not a binary win-lose. It's a transformation from not seeing something to being able to see something. And if we can do that in our discourse as Greens, we win. 
We win even if we don't technically win at the, the polling station. We win if the discourse moves in our direction. So if we're talking climate change in the coming election, if we're talking about the ethics of the, the biosphere, if we're talking about nonviolence, then we're winning. So that's why I don't, I, the lose, win, lose binary thinking, it's not, not, doesn't work as well when you're thinking about transformation as an ethic and a way of life, right? <clears throat> Cool, I like that a lot. Amanda, what would you say? Yeah, I like that too. I I also don't see this as a win or loss. This is this is like Mike said, this is our opportunity to change the conversation. And we're here to do that. And so what we're asking ourselves tonight is is who? Right? Who can lead us to change the conversation? Who is going to be able to attract and reach a diverse riding? Right? And so, and each of us brings a different skill set. And so, I think at the end of this, both Mike and I are united in, in the fact that every single conversation we have is about the climate emergency. When I'm talking to a bus driver who asks me why I don't, because I took the take the bus three times a week, why I don't get a car, I say, because we're in a climate emergency. So I'm ready to have those confrontations in a way that's still uplifting, but just the reality, we need to confront the reality. And so because I'm ha I decided to have those, uh, to be because I decided to make the climate emergency part of my everyday, my, my conversations all the time, I decided that, well, I might as well wear a green banner while I'm doing it. And, and so, as he said, we don't take off our green capes at the end of this. We're here to support each other and grow this space and grow this movement. Thank you. Beautiful. Okay, I've got another question from the chat. Should we see what it is? Um, okay, this one might, let's all ask it. How can you counter and improve upon the Leap Manifesto as one of the authors of it will be the NDP candidate in the writing? Now, is that too specific? Do we know what the Leap Manifesto is? Is that, you can also talk about how you will work with the other candidates against the other candidates in the writing if you like. But yeah, go ahead, Amanda, if you want to take that one first. Yeah. So I think that just to sort of bring up the fact that Avi Lewis is in this race and, and we, we shouldn't ignore that because certainly there's going to be quite a few green voters who are going to be and, and green members that are going to be attracted to Avi. I mean, who isn't, right? I mean... Yes, I, I also <laughs> love Abby Lewis, right? So, you know, it's, it's, it's part of why I'm running. No, I'm just joking. Um, no, I mean, what we, what we need to be able to do is that we're going to have to, uh, not only when he's making the conversation pieces around the climate emergency, which he talks about all the time, but bring back what his party's actually doing about that. And so, and the fact that, I mean, to this date, right, we haven't had an, a Democrat government being able to, you know, drop emissions like any other government. Only a green government is going to do that. Only a green government is going to stand up against big oil, big agriculture, right? We are the party that's going to do that. And so it, at all times when, when Abby is, you know, spouting our philosophies, you know, we need to hold his, his feet to it a little bit and say, okay, but you, you joined the wrong party. <laughs> and, and so that's sort of my hope to do that with that. But again, because he's raising these issues, it's so important, right? All of us are here for the same reason because we have no more time. So again, like I'm, I'm united with Abby, but also I wanna hold his, his feet to the fire and, and give him a good race. Yeah, I agree that Abby is a huge opportunity because the fundamental issue with Abby is that your party rejected the Leap Manifesto. They voted it, they didn't vote for it. And so what are you gonna do? How can you get behind under the umbrella, under the hat of the NDP, who are for Site C Dam, who are law, old growth login right now, and, and then say at the same time that you're holding the green ethics that we hold. It's a, such a juxtaposition. And actually in our riding, we have a beautiful opportunity to have a national influence on how people see the NDP. Because if a person can stand up under that hat, and I'm kind of feeling for the guy because obviously a likable fellow, obviously his father and his grandfather were NDPers. And what I kind of look at him, I go, you just need to drop the just drop where you think you belong and see where you belong. And where you belong, my friend, is with us. And this is the same thing with Patrick Wheeler. I feel, you know, deep down, the guy's actually got a lot of green values and he just can't do it. He's stuck in the liberal, he's stuck in the liberal hat. And it's time for us, again, transformational thinking, not binary thinking. We're not against you. We're going to transform you and pull you under our wings so you can see the light of what the Greens are saying and have always said, and that you're trying to change into NDP rhetoric, but you're in the wrong party. 
you're just in the wrong party. You got to come and join us. So this is where we have to be careful because I think we could allow people to see that through our EDA. We're, we're special, quite specially positioned in, our, in this riding to be able to have a four-way race and to be able to bring these issues up and to be able to point out that it's not the individuals. We can agree, we can have a discourse, a, a very good discourse like we're having tonight, and we can have a polite one, but it's the parties and the fundamental principles where the Green Party is at the very forefront of the political discourse in Canada right now. Sorry about the overtime there. Cool. So I've got another question. Um, how would you respond to the concern that we're a single issue party? A lot of people might feel that we're not equipped to run the whole government, so they don't want to put their vote with us. How do you respond to that concern, Mike, first? Well, in some ways we are, because I would say that the single issue that we are, the single value that we have is, is this love and caring that you see in Article 3, and everything comes from that. OK, but when it comes to if somebody said you're only about climate change, I would say, well, first of all, we know from the SDGs that the climate change is interrelated to all of the other all of the other 17 primary challenges that we have on the planet and the international discourses about that. In fact, all of the discussion this year at the United Nations will be about interlinkages between those. So if you stand up and say climate change, you're actually talking about poverty reduction. You're talking about infrastructure. You're talking about life on land, life in the oceans. These are all actually interrelated. And that is held. As a, as a perennial philosophy within our six core philosophies as ecological wisdom, because you cannot stand alone as a species. You're just interconnected, period. And neither are these issues standalone issues. They're not siloed like that. They're interconnected in a web. And so when you try to tackle climate change, you must tackle poverty. If you want to tackle poverty, you must tackle gender equality. And you see how this is working? So when they say you're a single issue party, no, we say we're an interconnected a party with many, many issues, but the singularity of it, if you want to talk singularity, is definitely that we need, we need a lot more love and compassion as we treat each other in these times, and as which the pressure of the planet and the planet's limits and its resource limits is putting pressure on us as a species. And that's where the Green Party is on very strong ground, very strong ground. No other party has the guts to stand up and call it a single issue, which is it is about caring and compassion about each other, and not just each other as, as people, but as a species, and also all sentient beings. That's critical. That's actually written down. And I love that read. I'll read that and I go, that's wisdom. That's a political wisdom right there. That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, single issue. It's funny because I have quite a few friends that mentioned this one to me. So I, I'm, I'm practiced in this response in the sense that first I say, have you looked at the platform in the last couple of years? So that's sort of first. And, and then, so, and so, the, and then, and then secondly, I say that in fact, you know, your perception of a single issue is actually, it's one of our greatest strengths, which is that we're actually focused as a party. We are focused and united on the need to reverse global warming and to actually advocate for the environment and the planetary boundaries that Mike's talking about. I mean, we don't have anyone other than us pretty much advocating for that at a national level in a government, right? And so, and we're a global party. And so this is not, the Green Party isn't a, a new party in Canada, we're a global party, right? And we're inspired from the global Green Party. And in fact, we're probably the one of the most internationally connected parties in that regard because of these shared values that, that Mike speaks of. And, and so, Whenever someone sort of, you know, sort of points out like, well, you know, you, you only are this one thing. It's like, well, actually, we're, we, have a plat we have a response and a, and a proposal for all the issues that we're facing right now. And I'm, I'm really excited to talk about with what issue is of most concern to you, because we certainly have a plan and a solution for that. We are the party of solutions. We're an innovative party and we're the party of the future. All right, thanks guys. So you have answered all of the questions from the Q&A, all of the questions we've prepared before we got here. I'm thinking it might be time for your closing remarks. Um, who's going to start, Richard? Um, well, the, the coin toss uh, allowed uh, Mike to make the decision and he chose to let uh, Amanda go first. So uh, Mike, if you'd like to take uh, the final three minutes to, uh, to wrap up and uh, I, I, I'm just so amazed. I, I'd like to vote for both of you, but uh, unfortunately that's not available. Um, it is also wearing, I know, to answer so many uh, very good questions in such a short period of time. Um, so I would like to give you the opportunity to um, 
sit back a minute, reflect on this evening, reflect on your position, and to uh, perhaps take a few minutes where it's not quite as rushed, uh, fully three minutes, which is actually quite a long time, and, and, and give us a sort of a, a round robin of, uh, of your views, your issues, your values. Uh, we've heard a little bit about your motivation for being here this evening, for wanting to, uh, to be uh, a candidate, um, willing to go to Ottawa, willing to represent us in, in the parliament, willing to, uh, to help govern the country in, in the right way, in, in the way that we believe is right as the Green Party. So, um, Mike, I'd like to give you the opportunity, followed by Amanda, to, uh, for three minutes just to give us a, a little bit more of an, an overview of, of where you see things. Okay, three minutes. Yeah, it feels a little longer than the two or the one and a half. Um, I think what we've done tonight is kind of exemplify for other people what we're doing. Right. Look, look at the discourse we've had. It's been good. It's not been confrontational. We have diverse views, but we feel unified. And that feeling gets people excited to understand that in the Green Party, we can do it. And in our EDA, I believe we can not just have an influence in our riding, but nationally right now and also for our own party. Because I think our own party right now, a lot of people are focusing on this thing, infighting, infighting. And as Amanda has pointed out, it's not infighting, it's a growth, it's a discourse. It's a way of coming to a deeper understanding. Of what does it mean to be a black Jewish leader, in, woman in this country? What does it mean to tackle tough subjects like Palestine and Israel? What does that mean? And it, what people are saying, oh, it's all disarray, disarray. Well, actually, no. This is how the environmental movement has behaved for many years. I've been in it for 25, 30 years. There's always discourse. There's always discussion. And when we, like tonight, have uh, polite, respectful discourse, right? Respect diversity is one of our core values. The idea that we can respect each other and move forward. And we can also respect our opposition. If we can go through this particular riding and show that we respect Abby, we respect Patrick. We respect, we respect everybody that's running and, and, but, and we keep it to the premises and the arguments are clean and we look at what they're saying and we look at what we're saying. We will win just because what we're saying actually is proving over and over and over to be correct. If you go back and if you live through the environmental movement long enough, you realize we said that 20 years ago and look, it's turning out to be true. So we were, you know, 20 years ago, you stood up and you were alone when you talked about climate change, or you had a few friends, or Elizabeth and I would meet in the pub and talk to Luis Como, and we would lament the future, and we would be scared stiff. I remember it back in the early 90s. And now you stand up and everybody's, yeah, they were right, right? You see, and that's what, how we have to behave. We have to know, okay, we feel like a few people, but we're actually at the creative wave, the very edge of the forefront of the political discourse in Canada. And our job is to keep that out in front so that the, the discourse leans our direction. It leans to where we need to go. And so that's why I'm very proud of the Green Party that we are the only party that says as the SDGs, the international discourse and what are the biggest problems we face as a planet are deeply, deeply embedded in our platform. And I'm hoping that they will be there in our new platform. And so this is an opportunity. I look at it and I go, hey, hey, wait, this is a huge opportunity we have right now. And if we can get our timing right, get our strategy right, even the sadly, the problem with being green is that if you are right, it's sad. If you're right, if it's 45, if it's 45 degrees in Kamloops on Sunday, we might be right about climate change, but it's sad and it brings up a lot of emotion for everybody, right? And so we have to recognize that we're fighting a couple of things here. It's not good to be right on some of these things. It's just, but we're going to have to be consistent, principled, united, stick together, stick to the premises and be respectful, work through this one and show Avi and show Patrick that they want to join us. Right? Either, either internally they want to join us or politically they want to join us. That would be a coup. The greatest general Nate never takes people on in the battlefield. You win before you get to the battlefield. So we can win the minds and the hearts of the Avies and the Patrick Weilers to switch to us. That would be a coup. That would be the thing I would love to see. <clears throat> I, like, I like Mike's comment, we can win the hearts and the minds. I use this all the time because if it was just the climate emergency, we would have already elected a green government. If it was just the climate emergency alone that informs its decision, then we would have a green government. But it, unfortunately it isn't. We need to win the minds and hearts. We need both. And so tonight, as you can see, we sh Mike and I share a lot of values. We share a lot of positions on a lot of issues. Of course we do because we're in the same party, right? So, but what we wanna ask ourselves in tonight is what is different about Mike and I? And the difference is this, it's, it's our leadership um, and in terms of the leadership style that we bring. Um, I bring a values-based leadership. 
It comes from my, my experience building a values-based business, a zero waste B Corp certified business for eight years, nourishing thousands of change makers every day. I take this very seriously, my values, and I bring it into every single part of my life in terms of how am I aligning my actions with my values. And so really, I want to acknowledge every single one of you that's here tonight, because you are doing something that is quite different from the norm, is that you are also aligning your values with your actions, and you're becoming active in a party, making our party stronger, a stronger democracy, a stronger community, by just being here, by just being active in this party and choosing. The leadership that I'm gonna bring is one of vibrancy. I'm gonna bring, I'm gonna energize this party like we've never seen before. I'm gonna bring, be bringing in innovators and, and different strategies. I'm gonna be bringing in the arts, the sciences, all of it. That's the campaign that I wanna lead is one of youth, vitality, energy. This is the campaign that I'm gonna lead and this is the one that you can trust is gonna win us the next election because when we energize people, they show up to vote. What we know is this, is voting is a social act. So the most important thing we can do is connect with our voters. And we need to ask ourselves, who is the person tonight that we believe is going to connect with the constituents, not only our membership, but the constituents, the larger constituents. I'm a mother, I come because I really believe that we need a different voice at the table. Right now we've got the Patrick, we've got John, and we've got Abby. We as a party need to put forth a diverse candidate to represent this riding and show that we can be a diverse party, one of the future. Thank you so much. And thank you to our candidate nominees who have joined us this evening, um, who have put their names forward uh, to what is a very challenging job right from the get go. Um, these two people put forward their own personal time, their own resources. I would urge people here this evening to support the candidate of your choice. Um, please go and visit their websites, which are available on our website, which is wssgreens.ca. Um, we're coming to the close of our meeting. I would like to thank uh, our uh, board members who have also used their time this evening and continue to use their time on a volunteer basis to support um, Green Works, uh, not just in election periods, but throughout the year and the years that we have served. And I've been very pleased to serve with you. Um, I would also like to thank our attendees, the, the audience, the people who took time out of their time to come and join us this evening to take part in the debate um, to raise the level of discourse, perhaps as a small party, that is the best thing that we can do is to be in the room, raise the level of discourse and, um, and, and point out the things that we really believe are very important, the things that need to change in the world. So um, I don't think there's any other notes that have to be made. I will bring up my um, uh, share my screen with my message from earlier in this evening, the agenda, uh, which also shows the reminder of our next event, which will be held on Monday. It is also the start of the uh, election period. So Mike and Amanda have a, a busy few days ahead of them to campaign uh, for, um, for their campaign. Uh, uh, to be the candidate and our riding as it is now their, their nominees, candidate nominees. Um, so the uh, end of the campaign will come with our virtual nomination meeting be held on Monday, June the 28th from seven until 8 p.m. It will be followed a, one hour later by a 48 hour email election period. If you don't have your ballot yet, it's because they will not be sent out until the start of the email election period. The Green Party uh, is helping us out. They have a, um, a vo simply voting, a voting service that uh, uh, conducts votes uh, elections uh, virtually online. And so a ballot will be sent out to people's emails. Please check your uh, spam, your um, promotional area of your website that you don't always check for your ballot and you will have a 48 hour period to make your, um, your choice known. If you're unable to vote by email, we have uh, Robin Spano, our uh, returning officer available by telephone uh, during the election period. Don't phone her this evening. Don't phone her at any other time except during the email election period from 9 p.m. Monday, June 28th 
until 9 p.m. Wednesday, June 30th. Robin would be very appreciative of that. Um, otherwise, see more details uh, at our website, which is wssgreens.ca. Thank you very much to everyone taking part this evening. Um, go forth and spread the word. Um, support the candidate of your choice. And thank you very much. All right. Good night. <clears throat>